So first of all, we wanted to talk about how technology and data are helping us as a region to work in health. And my first question is related to how much of mass data and not smart data, and how much is how many how much of smart data do we have that allows us to run prevention campaigns in our countries and in our regions? Should I begin? Okay. I will speak uh, English. The topic itself in general is fantastic, uh, and obviously we've had some recent uh, issues, Zika being one of them, um, that's highly relevant to all of us here and, and becoming increasingly relevant. There were really three main themes from Ecolab's perspective that we wanted to inject in today's conversation. I'm actually going to start with the second one because it's highly relevant to what you put on the table. Um, and I think that's the realization that while epidemics uh, such as that one, uh, other health challenges begin very local, uh, and the information around them is very, very local. We live in a global world uh, more and more every day, a very connected world. Uh, and any such epidemic, any such challenge, uh, any infectious disease is simply a plane ride away. I think all of us are realizing that over several instances over the, really the last decade. Uh, and so the ability to capture information, uh, to have a public-private partnership, to work with NGOs, private industry, public sector, understand information, communicate information, certainly without being um, crying wolf, so to speak, or getting the reputation of doing that in every single instance, we need to communicate quickly and really anticipate worst case scenarios so that we can mobilize uh, faster. Okay. If I, if I can add to, uh, to the topic of data, uh, I would say that data in healthcare has been challenged in the past and continues to be challenged. The ability to capture, record, organize, and have it readily accessible so it's actionable is a challenge. It's not a challenge of the region, it's a challenge of the world. It consumes significant amount of investment, and it is a significant portion of the cost of healthcare that we as individuals have to incur, but the response is not there. So we still have to find the right roadmap, the right path, to be able to gather the kind of information, the kind of data that we need, and then we need to get to the real step, which is how do we make it relevant, how do we get the right insight out of it, and then take action. So in our perspective, there's a long way to go, but it's, this is not a technology issue. This is a process issue. This is a, to some way, a regulation issue. And today, the technologies that support the massive accumulation of data have expanded so rapidly, especially in the last three or four years within memory technology, that the cost of acquiring and, and uh, being able to store that data is, is a fraction of what it was in the past. So it's not the technology that is the roadblock. Mm -hmm. En ese caso, le sería una pregunta a ambos. Eh, si no es un technology issue, ¿qué tanto hay de políticas públicas ayudando a que esa información se construya desde el punto de vista de los gobiernos? En términos de crear soluciones. De permitir esa confianza, permitir esos procesos y crear esa regulación de la que Claudio estaba hablando. I'll, I'll start, it's okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think... This reinforces gen the general theme of the of the workshop here, the session. But the the quality of collaboration, coordination between public sector and private sector is key um, to ultimately developing solutions uh, of quality and sustainability and, and effectiveness. Um, and and I think it's important to honor and respect that both both groups bring tremendous assets to that type type of challenge. From the private sector, obviously, the ingenuity, the ability to innovate, technologies that already exist building on information that's available to refine those, those technologies and make solutions increasingly relevant. That has to be embraced and harnessed. On the public side, uh, tremendous reach from the public sector, the platform for communication, the platform for education, again, reinforcing the need to have solid information so that we communicate the right things. And so the need to coordinate that and, co and collaborate uh, in that way is, is critical in order to solve uh, major health challenges that we have. Okay. The, uh, the issue of legislation or regulations is, is a very wide issue. Uh, you cannot address this in, in general in healthcare uh, because it has to do with what the physician does with the patient um, at, at the office, what, what the governments need to do to protect the privacy of, of the patient. Then how do you make sure that, that the healthcare is available at a reasonable cost? Um, and then obviously, how do you address the larger health challenges like 
Zika as an example. Mm -hmm. but, but getting back to the, to the basic stuff, the time that a physician spends in front of a patient cannot be challenged by having to enter data into a computer to comply with the regulation. That is in the way of really addressing the healthcare issue. So if regulations would make more difficult for mm -hmm. a doctor to address what he has or she has to address, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Es muy interesante ese punto, Claudio, y, y en ese caso les quiero preguntar. That point is very interesting, Claudio, and I wanted to ask you the Colombian government is beginning to work with some apps that begin, begins to be a trend. It's like a self care, and the other one that is called the Click Health, which allows the Colombians to compare the prices of their medication and evaluate the service. How advanced is the region in those types of solutions, or we? as patients you cannot still trust that type of solution and on the contrary we're exerting all the pressure on the doctor and the doctor now has, does not have the priority of his patient the the whole revolution of apps that goes all the way from fitness to to remote diagnosis diagnostics is is really an emerging chapter i don't think that this is going to be a regional Thing. It's going to be global. It's already global. It's, it, it's becoming readily available. And, and if anything, it, it extends the ability of a patient to understand his or her situation and work with the doctor. Now, we're, we're going in the direction of individualized medicine, where by means of technology, obviously data, and access to all these facilities, let's call them, you can have a better understanding of what is the patient's situation. And you do away from talking of, in average, this is what happened, or this is the total number of cases that we have, which is in the way of being successful in curing diseases. Mm -hmm. I maybe build on that a moment in an okay. adjacency, uh, embracing this digital space, and, and uh, not specifically about apps, but rather about social media, going back to the first comment about uh, data and communication and so forth. Um, we have platforms now with social media, uh, again, if mm -hmm. embraced properly between private industry and public sector, to run as fast or even faster than some of these epidemics and infectious disease spreads um, by harnessing that, taking advantage of that, and using that platform to communicate better. Again, getting back to communicating the right information and good information, there has to be some control there, but leveraging a digital space and social media can actually be a benefit uh, in running fast enough to get ahead of some of these issues. John, tú tienes una cantidad de experiencia en esa relación público-privada en los temas de salud. ¿Cuáles han sido las John, which have been the, some of the greatest uh, obstacles that you have found, knowing that we have a technology that allows us to do a lot of things. One of the greatest challenges that we face, and it's probably a theme that's actually come across many of the, the forum discussions here in Latin America, because I participated in a few already this morning, this idea about institutions and the, the quality of institutions in Latin American countries and the consistency of the institutions across the countries. Ecolab works very, very hard to develop a strong regulatory framework in conjunction with uh, public sector. That can be in infectious disease control, that can be in water and foodborne illnesses, that can be in food safety in general, many other things. Um, so having a partner there that is embracing that and willing to set a very high bar uh, to the benefit of society in terms of what those regulations are, what those codes are, but also having the capacity to infrastructure to uphold those codes and enforce those codes, which creates an opportunity that's commercially viable for companies to innovate, to spend money and innovate and continue to get ahead and serve society better. I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we face, not just specific to Latin America, but may maybe more acutely here than other places in the world. Okay. Lamentablemente son, son reuniones de 30 minutos, así que para darle el micrófono a ustedes. Unfortunately, uh, it's only 30 minute meeting, so I'm going to read to you some of the takeouts that I have here. One is that we do have information that we are creating, in fact, information that we're being smart, that uh, I see it more concentrated on the part of what diagnosing what is happening to us. Basically, that is what I understand from your words. The second takeout is is that in this uh, path of controlling epidemics, the challenge is not technological. The technology is there, but the challenge is the processes, the regulations, and the work methodologies. And the third one is that we still have great opportunities, and we, if we work 
as a team with the public and private alliances and associations. Now, I would like to take the opportunity of offering you the floor to ask questions from these two experts here. If we have a question, I would like to ask you. Which do you think is the impact of the lack of strong institutions in Latin America? For example, corruption, abuse of power in the field of health. So again, building on the last example, I just gave it's a great question, by the way. Um, we work very diligently with trade organizations, for example, trade organizations that may influence products such as disinfectants or other products in hygiene, general hygiene, um, infection prevention, those kinds of things, food safety. So working closely with those trade organizations and ultimately with government agencies is one thing. Um, and we can develop proper codes and we can work with them to understand what are the right protocols to have to pr protect society and ensure safety in those areas. But if you take corruption or simply lack of infrastructure or a lack of consistency uh, country to country, it's very difficult. Uh, for us to train and uphold uh, that level uh, country to country or even city to city. And so I think uh, the consistency um, of not just developing the right codes and the right regulations, but upholding them uh, and how that can be undermined by corruption or other things is a big issue for us. It's a big challenge. That, that can be in healthcare, that can be in food safety, that can be in hospitality, that can apply in anywhere uh, where, where public health is at risk. If, if I could, could add to that. Um I would agree with John. The situation you describe is across every industry, and healthcare is not an exception. However, in the last uh, two or three years, we've seen a more focused interest across the region by governments, both federal and state government, to try to address the issue of applying technology, to jumpstart or to leapfrog, is the right terminology, the um, the issue that we have with healthcare in some of the some of the countries, so there is a better understanding and there's more appetite to have a productive discussion, including how to prevent and get ready for pandemics that uh, we've we've had a fair share in the recent in the recent past, and it's something that will continue to be with us in the future, unfortunately. So we're not where we have to be, but there seems to be a little bit more interest to address the issue in the right direction. Any other questions? One, two, three, four. OK, go ahead. Good afternoon, Mariano Guerrero Rivera. Uh, Guerrero, Mariano, salud from Spain. I wanted to ask you something very important, accepting that the scientific bibliography says that over 65% of what we do does not contribute value in health. What do you think that new technologies, how do you think that new technologies can help solve that problem? To understand, could you please repeat your question? Many of the uh, things that are done in the area of health in the world do not contribute any value to the health of individuals in the community. I would like to ask you if, with the progress of technology, we might, how we could uh, solve this issue and save some money that we could use in this area. I give you an example. Both at the grassroots level and at the, the country level or region level. One that's at the grassroots level, which I like to talk about because it's it's something that can be scaled. It's something that can be leveraged. It's something that uh, we can all take action on. We, we work uh, with a program called WET, which is uh, Water Education for Teachers. And we're actually very active in Mexico with that currently. And that program is really about teaching teachers and their students about hygiene, basic hygiene issues, uh, as simple as the right way to wash your hands and prevent the spread of communicable diseases, but also about water management, water sensitivity, um, general ways in which we can reduce infection, the spread of infection. Um, and that's, an, that's a way where we've partnered closely with actual local communities, not federal governments, not state governments, but municipal governments and even school districts to engage our people in teaching teachers to teach their, their students. And I like that example because it's one that we can do everywhere. And as, as citizens of society, we can take action on and spread, spread quickly. And so it's about education and communication. 
Sí. Otra pregunta. Gracias. Robert Susan, Roberto Peck, I'm Medellín Herald. Can you give some specific examples of what technologies or services your companies have that might help reduce what's described as a collapse of um, services in emergency rooms? Certainly in Colombia, it's a big problem. Maybe elsewhere in Latin America. Yeah. Do you have some technologies that can help help reduce that overflowing collapse of emergency rooms? Of emergency rooms, I don't personally have a lot to talk about. That I don't. Yeah, it's not my area of expertise anyway. <laughs> but uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, uh, many of the challenges, the, the the bottlenecks that we have in the healthcare system, is is related to processes to the requirements of administration and, and the fact that we don't learn from one case to the, to the next one. So I, I'm not going to be here saying that data is going to fix everything, but as long as we take a very strong approach to building a data infrastructure that is actionable, we're going to start seeing more relevant time dedicated to what we have to do in healthcare. So I don't know if that would fix the emergency rooms in, in Medellin, but definitely in many areas of, areas of healthcare, that is the issue. And in the US, it is, it is one of the biggest problems. So from a technology perspective, we have a global healthcare business. Global does not include uh, Colombia at this point. It's, it's predominantly in North America and, and Western Europe. Uh, in hospital uh, applications, obviously general sanitation, hygiene is a big area where we develop protocol and technologies, but also in the operating suite, um, products and solutions and protocols to convert an operating suite after the operation to make sure that it's quickly sanitized, sanitized properly, and ready for the next operation with no corners being cut, uh, no shortcuts. And obviously that has a big impact on the safety of patients that are in the hospital because one of the best ways to get sick is actually to be sick and be in a hospital and pick up something else. So those are, those are solutions, application ranges that we have. We just don't, certain, don't currently have that reach here in Colombia. But perhaps you've gotten me curious moving forward, so yeah. Because it has been said that for the sustainability of the health industry, technology is very important so that the business is sustainable. Okay, two more questions. What is Iris? Um, forgive the accent. Um, so I was at MIT recently in the U.S., and they were talking about an application that Aetna has developed, the iHealth app. And the idea, Aetna is an insurance company, and they wanted to reduce the amount of wasteful visits to emergency rooms and doctors by their um, constituents. And this app would allow you to, for example, um, put in a child's symptoms if you were on holiday, and you could say, you know, we've done this, we've done that, we went swimming, and the air hurts, blah, blah, blah. And the app would give you a, a feedback relating to what the probable situation is and, a, and a, it would direct you to a, a local health center or a chemist if the treatment was less. Now I was listening to this thinking this would be a fantastic if we could develop it for developing markets but for, for markets where healthcare is socially provided and it's in our interest to reduce the amount of time that emergency rooms are tied up with unnecessary work for example. Have you done any work in those sorts of areas? That may be better for you at this yeah. point. Yeah, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very familiar with the, the app you're talking about. I actually used it myself a few times. And, um, and it's very effective because many times um, you, you go to the emergency room and your symptoms are, let's say, you're not, you're not, you don't have a life-challenging situation. And you probably are in the way of somebody that really has a, a life-challenging situation. So, so it allows you to move very fast to have diagnostics. And it's not just, you know, you, you enter the app and it tells you what to do. You have the ability to talk to a physician via video, you know, get a response. So, so again, the technology helps you and gives you another, another option to, uh, to resolve. And, and um, I know this is not a related issue, but, uh, but when you talk about trying to address a major health issue in a country like could be an epidemic. You typically think of, you know, how do I get to all the cases and try to address them, which is what you have to do. You know? uh, once you, you are in the reactive mode, 
you, you try to record who's sick, who needs uh, attention. And, and, and we, had, we at SAP had an experience in Nigeria with Ebola, where uh, um, the, um, the Nigerian government, with uh, assistance from the German government and uh, SAP and the uh, Hassel Plattner Institute, were trying to find a way to bridge this issue of getting to the cases and see how patients evolved and, and what, was, what was working and what was not working. So when we looked at this, people thought that this was really a healthcare issue. But it ended up being a logistics issue. Because you had your social workers or health first responders who were, work, who were trying to get to this person that was sick and try to monitor how he or she was evolving every day and was actually doing that, but it couldn't record on time the data to be able to learn and act accordingly to the general population. So it ended up being a question of how you build a mobile app to be able to help the person that was assisting the patient. So again, it's using technology to try to bridge the gap. So sorry for diverting, but I think it is a good example of, on how you can fight epidemics in that context. Okay. Adriana Molano from Colombia Digital. We know that the issue of healthcare is sensitive, and we know that the technology based solutions should come from the government to the citizens. But given the way that technology is being used, the way that it's being massified, it might it be that in this case, in order to obtain the big data and all that information, wouldn't be easy? Easier to massify the applications, uh, health-related applications, so that we can show the government the usefulness of those solutions. Uh, I cannot agree. <laughs> and 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 for for different reasons. The, the the first one is we heard this morning President Santos and President Macri talk about relation education and technology, and and uh, and that is the cornerstone of of changing our our countries. So that's one element that plays very well with what you just mentioned. But, but then, then there is this creativity that has characterized our countries in terms of bringing startups which are based in technology. We tend to talk a lot about Uber and B, um, Airbnb, et cetera, et cetera, but we have very strong cases in a region that have worked very well. And you know, at the end of the day, and, and um, at least the way we see it at SAP, is if you look at the digital economy in Latin America and you compare it with the rest of the world and pick any statistic that you want, we are 50% of what the rest of the world is. If we would be able, via startups for healthcare, entrepreneurship in other, in other categories, to really bridge that gap, we will be in the way of transforming our economies, but also in the way of transforming the well-being of our citizens. So there's more at stake than what we're talking. So that's the way, at least we modestly believe that the subject should be approached. Sorry for that. No, that's perfect. Leave it at that in case there's another question. Great. Good afternoon, Enrique Tapia from Noticias Uno. We have had a problem uh, during the past uh, months regarding uh, cosmetic surgery, and some uh, professionals in that field have been uh, have been announcing that they have specializations that they have not taken, apparent specializations in Brazil, and they're just diploma courses, and they ex and they practice here as if they had really studied each uh, specialization. So what platform or application could the government use to regulate those types of specialists, especially when it comes to cosmetic surgery, which has made so much progress and was the doctors who are fighting right now because they are not duly trained to practice these surgeries. How can I look uh, for an application that says this doctor, in fact, is telling the truth, this doctor, in fact, uh, specialized, etc. No, we can share just like that one. That that's where it's incumbent upon government to make an issue out of it and say that we want to protect the safety of, of people and society. And this is an area where people can get sick, things can happen, 
uh, treatment cannot be delivered properly, infectious diseases can spread, et cetera, et cetera. But tapping into the expertise uh, and the depth of knowledge that private industry has to educate how can things happen in that environment that we want to stop? What is bad? What does good look like? How do we develop protocols and training programs to ensure that even in that environment, the person that goes in and pays for the surgery is safe uh, and the next person after them is safe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's about diving in and tapping into the expertise that private industry has to understand the environment, understand how problems can arise and what is the protocol to address that and what should be regulated and eventually enforced to ensure that to have a license to operate in that way or, or to continue operating in that way, you need to meet a certain threshold. And I think that's where there has to be a strong partnership between the public and private sector. The public sector should not be the one that has all the expertise. That would be way, it would be unrealistic and too cumbersome to depend on them to do that. Tap into private industry and help them understand where are the problems, what are the potential problems, and what's the best way to address them. Antes de cerrar, con tres eh, take away more, yo quisiera preguntar una cosa. I would like to ask something else. Uh, we're talking about the data that the patients uh, provide, that the health centers should provide with her data, but how are the pharmaceutical companies, how willing are they to also provide data that could be more productive for the region? 30 seconds you have. Shape it as, as uh, in healthcare solely or, or environments where people are there to be uh, treated, it's not just that. I mean, you, you can get foodborne illnesses, uh, waterborne illnesses, communicable diseases can happen in many, many areas. And so I think it's important to think more, more broadly than that um, and to have uh, a standard established in society that we care about that. We want to create a safe environment for our people. That's where they go to eat. That's the food that's produced that they eat. That's the water that they drink. And it's also the places that they go to receive care. Okay. So that, that would be my initial response to that, to broaden that. Añadiría entonces tres conclusiones. Tenemos un 50%. I would add three conclusions. We have a 50% gap that is pending in the region. Communication is key. And apps seem to be becoming very interesting tools for the health sector. I want to give John and Claudio uh, my thanks for, um, for their comments in this panel. Thank you very much. And also to you all for coming.